Okay, so I'd just like to switch gears a little bit. I think we've had a lot of discussion in this session and actually throughout the conference about the need to expand uh, testing, expand it to communities, take it outside of the laboratory, have an expanded use of rapid diagnostic tests, which we know can work. We know that non-professionals can be trained to use the test. However, I urge caution around ensuring that when we provide new services and we expand, that we always have quality in the back of our mind and that we think about ways to assure the quality of testing in new environments. Obviously, we maybe, many of you know about the three C's. These were the consent, confidentiality, and counselling. And this was the way in which we, we sort of framed the discussion around access to HIV testing and counselling. However, we've expanded it and added two more C's um, around correct test results and connection and linkage to prevention, care and treatment. In terms of where do we deliver um, HIV testing and counselling, um, we have really two models around either facility-based, so the more traditional laboratory-based models, um, and we also have the community-based um, HIV testing uh, and counselling models. Uh, in terms of facility-based testing, we kind of can split it into either provider-initiated testing or to client-initiated testing. Um, but as I said, it normally takes place within a health facility. It's normally provided by a health professional. They may or may not be um, a laboratory um, staff, a laboratory personnel, but they've been trained to use the tests uh, if it's rapid testing. However, in community-based settings, we're talking about home-based testing. And when I say home-based testing, I maybe have a different uh, definition than for self-testing, home-based testing where actually there can be door-to-door -door, um, visits and testing can take place uh, in the home from a, a trained professional. Obviously outreach to key populations, using events such as sporting events, uh, marketplaces, other uh, places where people might congregate and which should be offered HIV testing and counselling, workplaces and schools. I think the issue around access um, of um, adolescents to HIV testing and counselling is an area which we neglect. Uh, obviously the age of consent prohibits um, individuals under the age of 18 being able to freely access HIV testing and counselling, but obviously upon debut of sexual activity, they are also um, a, an area that, um, a subgroup that, that requires HIV testing and counselling. But in essence, the quality standards that we apply to all of these different settings and all of these different operators or providers of the test are, are in essence the same. We have the same guiding principles around quality. It's just the way in which we apply them that would differ depending on your setting. So I'm just going to step us through um, a framework for the quality of testing. And this is sort of really from the perspective of a, a program manager or a policy maker, more so than from the, the lab perspective. I'm a lab person, so I kind of look at things often a bit differently. But we realise that when you're making decisions about implementing uh, expansion of H, uh, HTC, it's interesting to think about it in a framework. So I'm going to first talk about the source of the tests. And I'm obviously going to talk a little bit about what I spend most of my days doing which is the WHO pre-qualification program. We have for the past 20 years uh, assisted governments and procurers uh, in assessing the quality, safety and performance of diagnostics. We really focus on the sort of diagnostics that are used um, outside of uh, the developed uh, settings and in what we call resource limited settings. So these are products that haven't, don't have a CE mark, they haven't gone through FDA, they haven't been uh, looked at by the TGA, Health Canada or Japan. These are other sorts of tests and we, we actually focus primarily on tests that can be used um, at or near to point of care. So obviously a rapid diagnostic test for HIV diagnosis falls in that category. Uh, and just to sort of draw your attention to the, the three dark blue um, uh, boxes in the bottom, but actually it's a fairly comprehensive review um, we actually undertake. It's based on international best practice. We actually look at a dossier of information about the product. The manufacturer compiles this dossier, and obviously if they're interested in the use of their test in community-based settings by non-laboratory staff. We ask them to validate their product in that setting to see if there'd be any differences in performance. We also actually go to the site of manufacturer to go and see where they're making the tests. We ask them a lot about 
how they distribute the test, what agents they use, what distributors, what agencies, because we're interested to know how they get feedback about quality and if there's a problem in the field and the way the test is used, how does that manufacturer actually hear about that and actually make an improvement? And we all also conduct an independent laboratory evaluation very often I see papers that are written up about the performance of a particular new, great HIV rapid test. Perhaps it's a fourth generation test looking at antigen and antibody, or perhaps it's a new uh, immunofiltration test, or it's a test that's optimised for HIV2 detection. A laboratory evaluation is very useful in itself, however, it's, it's a snapshot at a period of time when you evaluate the test. And we actually use the dossier and the site inspection to look at the quality that underpins the way in which that test was made. So we use these three um, aspects to decide upon whether we would WHO pre-qualify a product or not. And it's a very important service that we uh, actually provide to our UN partners, so to UNICEF, to UNDP, UNFPA, but also to the Global Fund, and we work closely with um, the US government through PEPFAR. So once you have um, a list of pre-qualified products, normally this would be supported by a regulatory framework for diagnostics at a national level. However, we're fairly well aware that only one third um, of countries worldwide have a regulatory framework specifically for diagnostics. They may have a system for medicines, maybe vaccines, maybe medical devices, but often this element of in vitro diagnostics um, it is poorly regulated and that's where WHO steps in for this sort of interim period while we're also building that sort of regulatory capacity in countries. Uh, in terms of selecting how you would actually test, um, WHO issues a number of testing strategies. I'm actually going to present them here and I hope that you'll be able to have a, a closer look uh, in, on the conference website. We're making these slides available. We actually promote two different testing strategies that depend on the prevalence. So you need to know a little bit about your epidemic. The reason we have two is that we want to make it as cost effective and as quick um, uh, and as less resource intensive to get to a result. And so for both of these strategies, I'm going to present the low prevalence in a minute, you actually do need to have three tests at your disposal. The low prevalence, which is perhaps a little bit more relevant for this part of the world, uh, as I said, three tests in a row, all positive to confirm a seropositive status. This is actually the testing strategy for a person, however it doesn't preclude that the tests are done in different settings. So a test for triage or a, a screen, so to speak, so the first assay could perhaps be done in a community setting and then uh, the person, the patient or even a specimen referred for the additional testing. In a lot of sites across sub-Saharan Africa, this entire process happens in the community using rapid tests in a testing visit that would probably take uh, no longer than an hour and a half. The next step, well, the, the previous slide was actually very generic, you know, test one, test two, test three. How do you know which brands you should actually um, buy? There's a whole lot of tests available. If you just Google HIV test, HIV rapid test, there are hundreds and hundreds of rapid tests available, some as low as 20, 30, 40 cents. So it's very um, important that you validate um, the sort of tests you're going to use uh, in the different combinations. As I said, for either high or low prevalence, you'll need three different assays. Uh, unfortunately, it's often very hard uh, when you buy tests to know exactly where they're manufactured. Um, tests have a tendency to be rebranded. Uh, manufacturers will, will actually um, just sell certain components, like just the device or just the strip, and other companies can buy those tests. And so you actually don't really know. Perhaps assay one, two, and three are all the same thing under a different brand name. The reason this is important is that you might see differences in reactivity. If you see a false reactive test result on assay one, and assay two is the same test, you're likely to see the false positive result as well. So this, this, um, this validation and selection of the combination of assays is very, very important. And that's where it's really important to link um, community-based screening and confirmation to have an understanding of exactly what sort of tests are used in what combination. And certainly if you don't make a good selection of SA2 and SA3 to optimise for specificity, and what I mean by that is to try to rule out false positive results, you have a tendency to overclassify and to um, call the person HIV positive when they're not. And in an era of expanded um, 
treatment eligibility, you may well find, uh, certainly in some countries, are moving to CD4 independence. So it means you don't even need a, a CD4 for a, uh, a pregnant woman, perhaps, to go on, on, on to ART. Two test results alone, she may be on ART for life, and we don't actually know if that's a true result or not. So we do call and we do support um, national programs to develop validated uh, national testing algorithms. Um, many countries just have one testing algorithm. However, that's a little bit vulnerable uh, in, 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 uh, if you have an issue with a product failure, um, you maybe have a stock hour. So we actually recommend some backup um, products also be validated. Another key element around um, how you select tests is looking at how easy the instructions are. And this is really when you're thinking about who's going to use the test. Um, even for a laboratory technician who looks at these sort of test instructions day in, day out, can look through the most important things. And this is an example um, of the kind of test procedures that we often see for HIV rapid tests that are, are sold in this part of the world and, and in sub-Saharan Africa. We're sort of speaking in real general terms about using a pet to fill with specimen. I mean, uh, even, even for me, it would depend on what sort of pipette it is. Do I hold on to the end? Do I need to expel air? How do I avoid air bubbles? Uh, what is specimen? You know, uh, how did I even get it in the first place? Um, this infers that it's from a finger stick where you've actually used a lancet to pierce the skin and a drop is formed and you're going to uh, use the pipette to take it. But I'll just point you towards number four, which is actually the reading time. And this is actually the issue we see to be most unclear and very difficult for users um, to interpret. It says, allow five to 20 minutes after the buffer has been added for the reaction to occur. But, you know, if you have a strong positive result, you might see the test line earlier. You should wait for 20 minutes. So do I read the test at five minutes? Do I sit over it like a hawk, waiting for the line to come up? Do I go away, make a cup of tea, see another client, and come back in 20 minutes? And this has actually been a really critical point we've noticed with a lot of the tests where we ask the manufacturer to give us data to support this statement. Show me that you can read all of the test devices at five minutes. And you'd be surprised how few can actually provide that data. And we've had to um, uh, work with a number of companies selling products where we found the reading time to be the cause of inaccurate results. Another part of the test procedure that can give you inaccurate results is actually around the, you know, the mechanics putting too much specimen in, too little specimen in, too much of the buffer, this wash buffer that comes with the tests. Putting too much in can actually lead the test to overflow. If you don't put enough in, it actually doesn't give enough liquid for the test itself to work. And I don't know how clearly you can see these test devices up here, but they're affected by a very big pink streak that makes it very, very difficult to read either the control line or the test line. And this is actually what we call an invalid test result and you should actually uh, throw this test away and, and use another one. Um, as I mentioned about reading time, if you read too soon, you often see this sort of appearance uh, on the test device until it is cleared. If you read too late, you read you know, an hour later, you read two hours later, you read three hours later, you actually start to see the appearance of false lines. So it's very critical to uh, observe the reading instructions. So what happens when there is a problem with the test? What we found was we were spending so much time evaluating the tests, gathering information about quality, training all of our health workers, that then when something went wrong, it was like, oh, we've put so much effort in here, do we really want to know? And what we found is that there weren't very many systems in place to gather this post-market information. So WHO is actually producing some guidance. We've just had our first preliminary meeting and we hope to release the guidance at the end of the year to actually make sure that community organisations and other settings where testing is taking place, that they know how to um, lodge a complaint um, about the quality of the test. It might be something as simple as, I opened the test kit and it was a 20 test kit and there was only 10 tests in, uh, 10 tests in there or 10 droppers, things like this. In terms of just going to the last two points I have to make on quality assurance, Quality assurance is something that we talk about a lot. In fact, I could have just spent the entire presentation talking about this. Um, 
as you may or may not know, WHO and CDC are currently uh, updating uh, guidance around quality assurance. However, in essence, the basic principles do not change. We're using ISO 15189 and the CLSI guidance, uh, GP 26A4, to actually formulate um, a revision of our, our current guidelines. Um, and I just point out the two most commonly confused <laughs> um, parts of quality assurance being uh, external quality assessment or EQA and quality control and external quality assessment verifying actually the proficiency of the entire testing process, whereas QC is just looking to see did the test work or not. EQA is obviously much more inclusive. It actually tells you did you, make, did you get the right result to the patient. So in terms of how can we assure the quality of community-based HTC, we just need to keep things simple. We need to make sure that the operators are well trained and that they're proficient in all parts of the test process, so in specimen collection and actually performing the test, reading the results, and then interpreting those results. How do you look at that testing algorithm where you've got three different tests, you might have three different results, and how do you actually report that back to the client who's sitting in front of you? Obviously, a support of the laboratory is still very, very critical uh, in case there are problems for mentoring, for supervision, for just someone to ask when you, you need a bit of troubleshooting, something doesn't look right on a test kit. You've been using that test every day for a year and now all of a sudden it looks different. So asking uh, your colleagues in the laboratory to help and of course ensuring linkage to treatment and to care. So in terms of this aspect on training, as my last few slides, is not to confuse training with proficiency. They're actually quite different. Very easy just to train people and say, I've, I've you know, run 12 training workshops, trained 100 people, but how proficient are those people in terms of being able to perform the testing process? So using proficiency-based training, using simple um, SOPs, uh, the figure you can see here uh, on your left is, is just indicative of the sort of information we put in WHO reports. It's actually a simplified SOP which could be used for training purposes. In terms of the other sorts of WHO normative guidance that is available, there's a brilliant document that really talks a lot to this service delivery aspect um, of HIV testing and counselling that's available on our website. And as I mentioned, we're actually just reviewing the training package for how to uh, conduct uh, HIV-related point-of-care testing. So it won't just be rapid testing for diagnosis. It will actually also include CD4 viral load using the new and coming point-of-care tests and also aspects related to viral hepatitis uh, and STI diagnosis, which actually um, I could have just interchanged HIV and said hepatitis C here. The principles are exactly the same. This revision will hopefully be um, concluded uh, in the next couple of months and will be posted on our website before the end of the year.